looking forward to hearing from Gary Miller. Sitting around at the program committee last year, a bunch of people, what do we want to learn about? Someone said, oh, addiction is really an important subject. And it's everywhere. And I know that we're hearing a lot of data and facts and figures about addiction. But I had coincidentally just in Springfield doing some work heard of a group called Writers for Recovery, which focuses not so much on facts and figures and data, but on individual stories and storytelling as a way of recovering. Um, and I found Gary Miller, who is the co-founder and artistic director, creative director of Writers for Recovery, who also happens to be a neighbor practically next door. And that is also coincidental. Gary um, graduated from the Vermont College of Fine Arts with his MFA in writing and does what many of us have only dreamed of, makes a living as a writer, doing advertising, marketing, and all kinds of other freelance kind of stuff, right. yeah. um, And is anything else about him I'm going to let him tell you. So welcome, Gary. Thank you. Um, I apologize, I know it's Halloween and I probably should have worn something appropriate, um, but I didn't. So anyway, um, thanks so much. I really appreciate you all showing up. Um, I think uh, you'll agree that it's a really, that, that the addiction and recovery are a really important topic for Vermont and for the whole country right now. Um, we're in a crisis and so anyone who shows up to find out more about that makes me feel really good. Um, so I appreciate your showing, and I appreciate the, the invitation from Osher and, and from the Montpelier Senior Activity Center to come and talk to you folks. Um, so as um, Lawrence mentioned, I've been the, I was a co-founder of Writers for Recovery, um, and I'm the creative director. And if you don't know about us, um, first of all, before I forget, you can find out a lot about us by going to our website, writersforrecovery.org, online. Um, but what we mostly do is we go around, all around Vermont to um, community centers and recovery centers and correctional facilities and we give free writing workshops for people in recovery from addiction. Um, and I'll talk a little bit you know, more about that later, but it's been um, an incredible experience reaching out and engaging with people from all walks of life, all over Vermont, um, and trying to just, you know, use, teach them how to use writing to aid in their recovery, to kind of process the things that they've been through, to try to figure out what their path is and where they need to go, you know. And it's, it's, it's all um, works through, through writing. And it's been really amazing. It's been an incredible time. And I feel um, very grateful for that. Um, I myself have been in recovery um, from drugs and alcohol for 22 years. Um, and I did not do it through AA or any of the other traditional means. I just did it on my own. Um, and so I was kind of an outsider to the recovery community and there wasn't a lot that I really knew about addiction and recovery other than I had a problem with drugs and alcohol and I managed to stop that um, and put it behind me. Um, but I've learned a lot in the last four years, and so I thought I would share some of that with you all. Um, my, I got started through The Hungry Heart, um, which is a great, has anyone seen The Hungry Heart? It's, if you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend it. It's a fantastic film um, done by the filmmaker Bess O'Brien about prescription opiate addiction, up, mostly up in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, at the end of producing that film, Bess wanted to give back some, some thanks um, to the community of people who'd agreed to you know, take the risk of going public and saying, I'm a recovering addict, or even I'm still in addiction, and be in her film, and she wanted to give something back. So she held a six-week arts workshop um, in St. Albans at the, at the Turning Point Recovery Center, and we did writing, um, radio production, black and white film photography and theater for six weeks and I was lucky enough to be one of the writing teachers. It was fantastic, it was mind blowing. I had no idea what to expect and all of a sudden these people are writing the most incredible um, pieces of work, you know, just, just it goes straight to your heart and really they really had something to say. 
Um, but we thought it would be just a one-time thing. We didn't. We had, you know, we closed up at the end of six weeks. First time I'd really worked with Bess. It was great. And then a year later, I got a call from Bess, and she said, um, Burlington Labs, which does all the drug testing for people in Vermont, and the owners are both recovering addicts and very supportive of the recovery community, they want to know if you, they, they heard that writing part of it was pretty fun. Um, would you like to do a writing workshop in Burlington, and we'll fund it. And Bess called me up, said, you want to be the, the workshop leader? I said, yeah. Um, since then, we have done workshops from St. Albans, Newport, all the way up, all the way down to Brattleboro, all over the state. Um, we did one last fall at the Mohawk Territory in Quebec. I'm headed off this weekend to do one over in uh, Saranac Lake in the Adirondacks. I've done one at McLean Hospital in Boston, psychiatric facility in Boston. So we've really grown a lot, um, and it's been a it's been a great experience. Um, so that's a little background on how I got started. Um, when I started, I had when I first saw the Hungry Heart, I had no idea there was an opiate epidemic in Vermont. You, I mean, I don't. For one thing, I have nothing really to do with drugs anymore, um, and. I was quite surprised, as I'm sure many of you were, to find out that, you know, in Vermont, there are, there are a lot of people suffering from opiate addiction. Um, and in The Hungry Heart, I, you know, I learned a little bit about that. <clears throat> um, one of the first things I learned about the epidemic was how big it was. I don't know if you have any um, idea how, how many people in Vermont are addicted to drugs and I, uh, opiates, and I wouldn't know either other than the Department of Health has created this really handy chart. And I may have to step out a little bit. Can I take this with me? Yeah, yes. So um, I don't know if you can read all this. 17,844 people misused a pain reliever in, a, in 2015. So that means people are, who are, you know, quote unquote, abusing opiates, that's about 3% of the Vermont um, population by my math. Now I will say that I'm not a good math person, so maybe maybe a little off plus or minus. Um, 8,600 opioid dependent people treated. That's about 1.5 percent of Vermonters. Um, but when you look at that figure, I think it's it, you, you also need to be mindful of the fact that there are a lot of people who didn't seek treatment, so the number's probably higher. Um, 403 community naloxone reversals and 200 for emergency department discharges, 1,375 EMS overdose calls. Those numbers have gone up since then, um, but that's just 2015. So that gives you just a little bit of an idea of the numbers that we're talking about. Um, but it's also important to remember that that's only one type of addiction. Um, in Writers for Recovery, we don't ask you to tell us what your addiction is at the door or to prove that you're addicted to something. Um, we just ask that you show up and write for us. There's no, you don't have to share any information about yourself if you don't want to. But I will tell you that in, in the course of the four years I've been in there, I've dealt with people addicted to meth, meth cocaine, marijuana. And I know people say there's, there's, you know, there's controversy about marijuana addiction, um, but I can tell you that there are people that, who are addicted to it. It may not be as addictive, say, as some other drugs, but it's definite, because I've worked with these people and I know, um, and they suffer because of their marijuana addiction. Alcohol, of course, probably the biggest, the biggest one. Um, but we also deal with people with food addictions, with sex addiction with internet addiction, with gambling addiction. All of these people um, have made their way into Writers for Recovery. And so, you know, now you start thinking about those numbers getting a little bigger, right? Oh, 1.3% opiates. You know, and, and, and you start to realize that there's a lot of people. About one in 10 Americans, according to the National Institutes of Health, is, are, are addicted to a substance. So, do the math. Oh. Before we do the math, um, in, in elders, um, the addiction, it, it's often you know, underrepresented or misdiagnosed, but it's huge. Um, I read a figure that uh, the highest percentage of addiction to alcohol is widowers above the age of 75, percentage-wise as a demographic. Um, 
is 6% of hospital admissions for elders are for substance abuse, 14% of ER visits, and 20% of psychiatric uh, admissions are for substance abuse. So the population that you, know, that you live in and your the demographic, you, your friends, your relatives, your age, you know, are all, it's not, you know, I think, and I think a lot of time people don't really think about that. They think, oh, drug addicts are young, you know, and I learned about that in all sorts of different ways. For instance, heroin addicts tend to be a little older than you might think, you know. Um, so this, this is the demographic um, of concern to people here at this center, but also it should be to everybody. About 63,000 Vermonters um, are addicted or suffer from addiction. That's based on 10% of 630,000. Um, that's a lot of people. I don't know what you think. The population of Montpelier is about 8,000. So think of, it, think of it in those terms and you start realizing that you're, um, you're talking about a real number of, of, uh, of people who have a substance abuse problem. And we know who they are, right? Do we? We know who they are, you know, because we see them on the street. They're out there, they're, they're, you know, they're sleeping in the street, they're asking us for money, they're breaking into our cars, right? That's who it is. Or do we? <laughs> and so the second thing I learned um, in Writers for Recovery is the amazing diversity of people who suffer from addiction. And it is just those people that, who fit the stereotype, they're part of it, right? It's not, it's not to say they're not, but other people are less visible. And so in Writers for Recovery, we've had everyone from that person who comes in off the street, who's living in a tent, who's addicted to heroin, to a college professor, an educator, you know, a professional engineer. You know, all these people have made their way. And age, age groups, we probably range in age. We, we don't work, we, we've started recently working with kids, um, but we mostly work with adults. And so literally our, our um, the people we've served have ranged in age from 18 to 80. Um, and, you know, Vermont doesn't have a lot of cultural diversity as far as race, but we've had, we have racial diversity too, although like, the rest of Vermont, most of the people in our groups are white. Um, and so you see that, you know, it's not, it's not just that stereotypical person. So that's one, that's one thing to recognize, right? Um, but another thing to recognize is when you think of someone who's an addict, a lot of times you might think of them as not having a lot to offer to the world or maybe not having their, um, I guess their act together, you know, and, you, and what I've learned over the last um, four years is that people in addiction can really, really surprise you. Um, so as I said, I, I had been in recovery for almost 20 years. I hadn't had a lot of contact with people in recovery, um, but I met people in recovery right away. And I was terrified, by the way, because I had no idea what was gonna happen when I interacted with these people because I'm not a social worker, I'm not a trained um, you know, recovery, I don't, I don't have a recovery certification to be a recovery coach. It's one of my goals for this year and I hope I'll have it done by the end of the year. But I'm not trained in that, I'm just a guy who wanted to go in and, and you know, my primary skill is writing and, re you know, and reading. Um, and I just, I, I was a little nervous and going in um, one of the first people I met was a guy named Stan Worthley. Um, he came to our very first Burlington group. Um, and it's, by the way, I want to let you know, we do have a confidentiality policy in our meetings, like anything that's said in the room stays in the room and identities are kept confidential unless permission is given. And I want to be clear that Stan has given me his permission to talk about him. He's in fact become a great friend of mine. And, He's, he's been a great um, spokesperson for Writers for Recovery. Um, so Stan came in to the first group um, I was in. He had um, crippling post-traumatic stress disorder. He had crippling shyness in addition to that. Um, Stan was raised in Gloucester, Mass, a, a fishing community in Massachusetts. To, both of his parents were drug addicts. 
He was a high school dropout. He was very, very angry. Um, he had a hard time, you know, any kind of social interaction he was terrified of. He self-medicated with all sorts of drugs. And he was living in, I believe it was the Burlington area, but I could be wrong about that. And he had a roommate who also liked to drink and take a lot of drugs. And one day his roommate got a big old bottle of vodka and said, let's take a ride in the car. So Stan went along with him. And about halfway through the ride, it became clear that what was happening was that the roommate was going to murder, was on his way to murder his estranged girlfriend, and he had a gun. And Stan immediately started to panic, but he couldn't jump out of, you know, jump out of the car. So they pulled into a parking space. His roommate got out with the gun, went around the corner, Stan heard gunshots, ran around the corner, and his roommate had been shot dead by the police in the middle of the street. Um, Stan had very, very severe PTSD from this, from this situation. Uh, because it was involved, for instance, when I met him, because it, was, it had involved a telephone, he couldn't talk on the phone. He couldn't use a phone for probably three years, um, not even for texting, because it was so associated, because his roommate, I think, had called him on the phone and invited him along or something. Um, so that was Stan when I met him. Um, keep in mind all those things, that he's not an educated person, that he's really struggling, that he's having a hard time, that he's got PTSD, that he's got crippling shyness. The first night Stan showed up, he kind of mumbled his name and sat with his head down pretty much the whole time. The second time, he didn't write at all. He didn't read anything he wrote because he didn't write anything. The second time um, he came, he wrote a poem, and I gave, them, I gave out the prompt, I am from, um, which is a common prompt that's given to school children to, to talk about family background and history. And I'd just like to share with you, now I want you to keep in mind, you know, keep a, a, a picture, try to develop a picture in your head of who this person is, what he might look like. I'll tell you, he was very sullen and angry and closed off and, and tight. And this is the first poem he wrote, and I'll, I'll read it to you too. I think I will. Will I? Uh oh. It's not working. Um, okay, we have a technical difficulty. Here we go. Okay, I am from. I am from the small towns of New England where everyone knows what you had for dinner, where the sea was once a way of life and a badge of pride and the resting place of lost loved ones. I am from the back country roads we drove with no destination in mind, where the leaves on a cool fall day danced to the sounds of small block V8s thundering by and the rubber left at stop signs was the only proof we were there. I am from the place of memories, both good and bad, where I had bowed as a peasant and stood as a king, where the greatest of hardships showed what would become the greatest of strengths. I know where I am from, but if you ask, I do not know where I'm going. Are you surprised by that? I was extremely surprised and delighted by that. And that, that taught me a really valuable lesson. Um, that I hope, if nothing else, you'll carry away with you today. And that is, um, people in recovery just aren't who we think they are. You know, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Stan, um, I think two weeks after that, um, wrote a poem, a long poem, about the incident that led to his P PTSD with his um, friend shooting, you know, getting killed. Um, and read it out loud in the group. He'd never told that story, even to his therapist, over two years. He'd been with for over two years. He'd never told the story to anyone. He read it out loud in the group. Like a week after that, he agreed to have it published in the Burlington Free Press. And probably four or five weeks following that, he went with me on live television to talk about Writers for Recovery and how, how much it had changed his life. So these are the kind of things that I've been experiencing. Can you see why I'm excited about this program and why it's really been great? 
Um, but the main lesson from Stan, I only wish he were here and you guys all could get to know him. He just moved to Maryland to kind of start a new life. Um, he's doing really well. He's now been in recovery about six or seven years um, since I first met him. Um, I wish you could meet him, but I just want you to keep that in your mind that, you know, here's this guy who's uneducated, who's angry, who's been raised by drug addicts. And like, I just kind of held on to that for my whole time to say, you know, it, it, even people who have slipped down really, really low can make an incredible comeback. And that's the lesson to me of Stan. Um, so this is what I learned here from Stan. Addicts aren't someone else, they're us, okay? They're all of us. One in 10 means technically, probably, someone in this room has or has, has had in the past an issue with drugs and alcohol. Yeah, someone just raised their hand, yeah. Um, me too. <laughs> um, and don't feel pressured to say that. Um, but, you know, it's true. It's your brother, it's your employer, it's your employee, it's your best friend. It's your niece, it's your nephew, it's your daughter, it's your son. And if it isn't, it's somebody else's daughter, son, niece, nephew. And all these people are as smart as we are. <laughs> you know, they all are. They all have that potential in their minds. I mean, I've worked with <coughs> people who can barely um, spell, can barely read, and yet they write the most amazing, sometimes we even have to spell for them, you know. And yet they have really profound, uh, insightful, and interesting things to say. And so that's a, that's a huge lesson for me that I, that I learned. Um, don't underestimate them. Um, they're as talented and resourceful, too. I've met people in Writers for Recovery who are amazing artists. Stan's an incredible mechanic. He can do anything on earth with a car, make it fly practically. Um, computer programmers and comic book artists and all sorts of, and, and musicians and all sorts of people with just remarkable talents and resources because when your recovery can bring, uh, addiction can bring you down so low that you, you need remarkable personal resources to come out of that. And so anyone who's, who's made it into recovery, you know, even for a little bit, it, it takes an incredible amount of fortitude and courage um, to face up to whatever that issue is and try to do something about it. Um, and, it, and, it, and they're as flawed as we are too, okay? And nobody's perfect in this world. I'm not a perfect person, no one's a perfect person. Um, everybody has their flaws, everyone has um, the parts of their past and, their, and maybe their present that are really painful that contribute to kind of things like addiction. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're not really different from us, they are us. Um, and one thing is, the decisions they made cost them more than they ever could have imagined they would. No one imagines when they take a first drink or, or smoke a joint or even snort heroin for the first time where they might end up. And, and um, I think that's critical to remember that, you know? Um, we'll talk more about that. Does anybody have any questions, by the way? One. Yeah. Just a simple one about Stan, because he's the only one I know. How did he have that vocabulary? You refer to him as uneducated. I, I don't know. Um, maybe he reads books, maybe he watches movies. I don't know, but yeah, it's, it was pretty impressive. Um, maybe on what? Maybe unschooled. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's a very interesting guy in a whole lot of ways. Um, yeah. I just don't like you referring to them and us, we and you, uh, uh, throughout here. It's, we're all us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It is. I, I, it's clear. They're, yeah. Um, I apologize for that. I'm just trying to make a distinction that we think that we're not part of that, but we are. That we're not, that we're not all this population. So I hope that answers your concern. Um, what? Point it at the computer. This one. Okay. Can you, okay. So I just I just want to talk um, a little bit about the nature of addiction, and I want to make clear that I'm not an expert in this department. Um, I'm learning, and I'd encourage you to try to learn too if you're, if you're interested. Um, it is a critical uh, subject, and the more uh, people who understand it that we can get, the better. So 
Can you just click that pad again? What is addiction? Um, you know, we say, we use that word a lot, right? We use, oh, I'm so addicted to chocolate, or I'm so addicted to Candy Crush, or I'm so addicted to Facebook, or I'm so addicted, or boy, that stuff sure is addictive. Um, and I think, we, you know, by and large, we understand that there's a difference between a statement like that and real, you know, actual addiction. And the way it's been explained to me is that um, the difference is addiction is kind of the compulsive, there's a compulsive nature to it, and, and, and you keep doing, doing it despite the fact that it's causing damage, obvious damage to your life. Um, and that was certainly the case with me. I, I, you know, drugs and alcohol had a big negative impact on my life, and yet I just wanted to keep doing it. And I would, you know, the hangovers, the, 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 you know, the scenes that I caused, the breakdowns with friends who were telling me, you know, hey, you're not in good shape right now. And I, I thought, yeah, my, my response to that was always, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm, you just don't understand, I'm having a great time and you're, you should be having one just like me. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a clear um, distinction and that's, that's a way that it's been explained to me. Why do people get addicted? Um, in the past, I think especially, there was this idea that if someone had an addiction issue, it was a moral failing on their part. You know, he's a drunk. She's just a drunk. She's a, he's an addict. You know, and there's still a lot of that too. There's still a lot of negative, um, negative kind of attitudes about people with addiction. And and you know, I think uh, it's great that we're coming around as a culture to recognizing that it's not a moral failure to be addicted to, to something. It's not. Um, so why? Is it that drugs are so addicting? That's the idea um, that you'll hear about a lot of things. You know, heroin, heroin is no, you know, you, you'll hear like, heroin is 20 times more addicting than alcohol or cigarettes are the most addicting. I mean, I'm sure, have you all heard things like that? Um, is it genetic? Um, you know, you've heard there's a genetic uh, predisposition. Um, could be part of it. My father was an alcoholic. Um, chances are that made me, you know, studies, studies show that that made it more likely that I would be. Um, maybe they don't understand how and why that works, but certainly there is a genetic um, component that you've probably um, heard about it. Um, or is it something more complicated? You can probably guess what the answer is. It's, oh, uh, wait, ah, hold on. You gotta go back a few here, keep going. There you go. Okay. You didn't see that number flash up there, did you? Um, okay, so it, let's just take an example here. Um, we all hear that heroin is extremely addictive. You ever heard like, try heroin once and you're hooked? You know, I tried heroin once. And for some people, that is most certainly the case. Um, but how many of you, and I've taken prescription opiates, anyone wanna share that they've taken prescription opiates? Um, and I'm guessing that most of the people here who've taken them are not opiate addicts, and that maybe someone is. Um, but, uh, you know, you go to the hospital, you get a course of opiates. Sometimes, my, you know, it, it could be for a long time. I mean, if you have a severe hip fracture or something, you know, you're going to be in the hospital for a while with a lot of opiates going through your system, and yet they're going to stop doing that when you go home, probably, or taper you off, and you're going to be able to deal with that and not become an addict. Um, and and um, I just also want to want to put a little quiz in here. How many opiate prescriptions were written in Vermont in 2015? Anyone who didn't see that number up there when we accidentally flipped through, hazard a guess? 76,000. Huh? 76,000, 76, that's a pretty big number. That's a lot of prescriptions. That's like, a, what's 76? It's almost one in 10. That's over one in 10. One prescription for every 10 people in Vermont. That's a boatload of prescriptions. Ah, click. Oh, come on. 
How about 601,506 prescriptions for opiates in Vermont in one year? That's a lot of prescriptions. What were those opiates? Huh? What were they? Um, they were probably um, oxycodone, percodan, uh, what? Percocet. Just pain, you know, pain meds for, um, for people who have a wisdom tooth taken out or have a surgery of some type or break their arm. What? Fentanyl. Fentanyl, yeah, fentanyl, right. Um, so one would think that if 601,000, to me the math is, you know, if you look at the math, 601, that's almost a one prescription for every person in Vermont, and yet only about 1.3%, 5% of Vermonters are seeking treatment um, for opiate addiction. So something's going on, like clearly a lot of people are, um, are taking opiates, but not a lot of them are becoming addicted. So why? Yep. Rat Park. That's why. Rat Park. Rat Park is a science experiment. Um, way back in during the time of the Vietnam War, a doctor was working with returning Vietnam vets, and he observed that a lot of these vets had taken heroin in Vietnam, used it as a coping mechanism, whatever. Um, it was pretty prevalent among GIs. Um, and yet, when they came back home, the vast majority of them did not continue to use heroin. He didn't understand that because he knew about a famous experiment, and you probably know about it too, um, where they would take a rat and put it in a cage and they'd give it two bottles of liquid. One would be pure water, and one would be water with heroin in it. And that rat would drink the heroin water until it died, effectively. And that's all it would do, it would just drink heroin water. Um, and so this guy designed a different experiment. He called it Rat Park. He built a big, big enclosure, um, not just for one rat, which was the case in the, um, in the first experiment, but for lots of rats. And he put in climbers and toys for them to play with and lots of snacks and food. And all the rats could run around, they could be social, they could play games, they could have sex, they could you know, do all these amazing things that rats naturally do. And he put a bottle of water in there and a bottle of heroin water in there and guess what happened? They didn't drink the heroin water at all, okay? And he theorized from that that um, there's a huge, huge environmental component to addiction, okay? Um, and I think based on just my work with people, you know, and hearing all the stories of the people that I work with um, and their backgrounds and the environment they grew up in, particularly the guys in prison, you know, um, I, I fully support the idea that there's something to this. Um, that it's, that it's, you know, an environment in which there's so much pain um, and inescapable pain that you need something to take to, to medicate you for that. Um, I know I grew, I grew up in a, not the most stable house. It was kind of stable in ways. Um, but I also grew up with a really low sense of self-esteem and I really struggled as a kid. And boy, I still remember the first time I took that big slug of beer and it was like, ta-da, ta-da, everything is great right now because I've got this in my system. And people describe that again and again, you know. And so some people, I worked with a, with a kid um, actually in prison, he was a, he was a, um, a lacrosse player at Emerson College in Boston, and he hurt his shoulder, and he had to keep playing to give, uh, to, in order to keep his scholarship, or he'd have to leave school, so they jacked him full of oxycodone. That was it for him. Instant, instant love with that, and he ended up a heroin addict and in prison. Very promising, very bright young journalist. Um, and similarly, oh, I keep doing this, but it's not working. Um, 
Yeah. Does anyone know about In the Realm of the Hungry Ghosts, uh, a book by Gabor Mate? Anybody know about that book? Um, he, just, he's, he ran um, a clinic in Vancouver for addicted people for decades, and this book is considered one of the, um, the best books about addiction. And he describes um, addiction as this hungry ghost that's inside you that can't be filled by anything but the drug. There's something that you need to have in your life that you don't have, and that drug fills the hole. Uh, it, it, incidentally, it's a fantastic book if you're interested in really finding out um, a lot about addiction, a lot, and, and hearing some great stories. That's a great book. Um, he also focuses on the idea that, that a pain most often developed during childhood um, is at the root of a lot of addiction. So, um, so what does addiction do? It, it stops it stops development. If you, if you are 13 years old when you start using drugs and you, and you use, you know, you're an addict and you stop at 25, emotionally and as far as coping with the world, you're still 13. Um, and so that's a, that's a problem. Um, addiction alters the brain. Um, it actually physically changes the way the brain works. It, it severs your human connections and creates an isolation. And those are all very damaging. And, the, and um, they're also, isolation incidentally is also a big sign of, of addiction. You know, people are isolating. That's, a, that's um, a good way to tell that there might be something up. So these are kind, kind of the negative. No one wants to be an addict. People say, oh, they did it. On, you know, they did it to themselves. It's all their fault. You know, no one starts out and takes heroin and says, you know what I really want to be in my life? I want to be on the street homeless, breaking into cars for money, to get money for heroin so I won't get sick. Nobody dreams of that. That's no one's dream, you know, and for good reason. And the best thing I learned from this whole thing is that recovery is possible. Recovery is possible. There's a great um, graphic novel, and it's called Larceny in My Blood, a memoir of heroin handcuffs and higher education. And it's about a guy who was raised by a mother who was a drug dealer, an absent father, started selling and using heroin at age 16, was in prison for most of his life until he was about 50, and then decided he was gonna get sober, went to Columbia University, got an MFA in journalism, and wrote a beautiful graphic novel about his heroin addiction. He's an incredible artist and now teaches in a university in Arizona. Um, just think of all that time, a, a, a life where he was down so low and he can come back. And that's a huge lesson I've learned again and again with the people in Writers for Recovery is um, that recovery is possible. And I've seen it again and again. In Vermont, we're a model. Do you guys know this? We're a model for the entire nation for dealing with heroin um, and opiate addiction. All states are looking at what we're doing because we're doing it right. We're having an impact. Um, we've got a goal of treatment on demand that in many cases is actually being met. Prior to Governor Shumlin's initiative of a few years ago, that was not the case. There were incredible waiting periods for people who even wanted to get um, clean, and they just couldn't do it. There, was, there were no resources. Now we have this great hub and spoke system where we have nine intensive detox facilities all around the state. They're, they're the hubs. And then smaller places, doctor's offices and things, where people can go and get medical assisted treatment. It's called MAT, you'll hear that a lot. Um, with buprenorphine, um, methadone, or naloxone, I'm not sure if we're using naloxone as a, as a treatment. We're using, naloxone is the drug that revives people um, from, a, from a, um, an overdose, but it also can be used in smaller levels to prevent um, heroin from activating in the body. So if you're on naloxone and you shoot heroin, it won't have any effect. Um, and then support groups like AA and Writers for Recovery and all sorts of other ones, and you know, this makes me so hopeful 
because years ago, and I, believe me, every uh, six months you see an article about how AA doesn't work, it's a waste of time, it's this ridiculous obsession with God and all this stuff. I don't like to hear that because I, A, I know so many people who've been helped by 12-step programs and, and indeed had their lives saved by them. And B, because y y like back when, that was probably the only thing you could do. But now there's all sorts of options. You know, AA doesn't work for anyone, everyone, but that's okay because for the people it works for, it really works. But some people prefer a writers for recovery. Some people have, you know, sober book groups and sober hiking groups and sober, you know, whatever, other things. Some people live in sober houses. You know, there are all these new kind of approaches to sobriety that we didn't have before. And they're, they're really critical. And they're, you know, they're a, they're a way of, of, you know, getting ahead of this a little bit. And we're doing it in Vermont in particular. Some places aren't. New Hampshire's terrible right now. Um, they, they, they have a real mess over there and they're not, part of it is they're just not putting enough resources toward it. They just, they're just not interested in doing that and, and they don't, I think, it's a shame because they're paying on the back end with, with people dying, with, with tremendous costs for emergency care and, and all sorts of things like that. So you should be glad you're part of, part of Vermont and in a, in a state where we're really looking forward and setting an example. Um, but recovery is a difficult process and relapse is common. It's very common. We used to think like, oh, he went to recovery and he got sober and that was fine. And if he didn't, if he fell off the wagon or she did, that was, a f that was it. That was a failure. They didn't do it. Now we understand that it's a process, you know, and so it, it, a good analogy is just like quitting smoking. Like who quits smoke? I quit smoking. Who quits smoking on the first try? Hardly anybody. It's really hard. You know, and we don't, we don't, you know, we tend to applaud people. Oh, try again, try again. And recovery from any other drug is very much a try again kind of scenario. You know, someone will come to a writer's for recovery, then I won't see them for three weeks. Then they'll come back. Well, what was going on? Well, I went out for, it's going out. I went out, you know, I went out and I used for a while and now I'm back. Okay, great. I'm glad you're back. <laughs> that should always be the response. Um, this idea of judging people as failing and, you know, because they don't, they don't get it right on the first time. But it's a really, really hard thing. And a lot of people have, you know, lost so many of their resources, lost so many of the people who can help them. Like they're re really rebuilding from the ground up. And that's not easy for anyone. It's particularly hard when you're at the same time trying to fight against uh, the lure of addiction and wanting to use again when you don't have the financial resources that you need. If you come out of prison and you can't get a job because you have a record, like all these things are really um, weighing against you. So how can we help people in addiction to recover? How can we, we, all of us, help people? By practicing the opposite of addiction, um, and this is the big finish, so get ready. But um, to me, the one thing that I've learned over this entire four years is that the opposite of addiction is not necessarily recovery. The opposite of addiction is community. And community is the solution to addiction. When people in with addiction are welcomed in to a community who loves them, who supports them, who cares about them, who's willing to help them in their recovery, to accept them, to forgive them the mistakes they've made. That is what we need as a society. You know, the, the, the condemning, the, the belittling of people with addiction, the, the, the marking them as moral failures, um, that's not gonna work. Locking people in prison is never going to work. It's not. Um, it only makes people work, feel worse. Um, there's a, Bess O'Brien. Has anyone seen Bess O'Brien's new movie? Yeah. So if you have, you know what I'm talking about. It's called Coming Home, and it's about a, it's about the COSA program, which welcomes people back from prison, and and supports them. Volunteers meet with them once a week to help them find housing, get a job, deal with their problems, everything. 
Go see this movie. If you don't cry at the end, I don't know what, because I cried twice. I saw it twice and I cried both times. It's an incredible movie because it's about what it takes to, to heal this problem, right? People, and, and, and if you are involved, like the one, another great thing that's happened to me in this whole thing is that I'm now within a part of the recovery community and you've never met a more amazing group of people in your lives, you know? How much they care for each other, how much they love each other, how much they support each other, how non-judgmental and compassionate they are toward people with addiction is just remarkable to me. It's just remarkable and I have to say, you know, I've made so many, I've met so many amazing people and made so many amazing friends in the recovery community and to me that's, you know, like I didn't go in this trying to get something for myself but I ended up getting something incredible which is to be part of this incredible community. Um, so I would just encourage you, if there's any way that you think you can contribute to creating um, a welcoming, supportive community for people with addiction and people in recovery, I'd encourage you to do any little thing, you know, whether it's, it's write a, a letter to the local paper or you know, call, a, call a representative and say, hey, can we get more funding um, for more treatment beds? Can we get more, a particular problem, housing for people coming out of prison? You know, it's hard for them to get out of addiction when they don't have a place to live. You know, can we do something about that? You know, a a any, the smallest, tiniest thing you can do, because if we all work together as a community, it does, it, everybody doesn't need to spend 40 hours a week doing it, you know? It's, a, it's, all, it's all by little pieces. So, yeah, I think that's it. Is it, can we, can we? Oh, I forgot, yeah. Huh? Yeah, that's it, pretty much. Um, anyway. <laughs> Um, and I know there's probably some other questions you might have about addiction. And again, I'm not an expert, but I will try my best to answer any question you ask. Yeah. One is a question and one is a comment. Um, I've been in the field of addiction for 30 years and in New York. And I would say I would add to the list shopping. Maybe it doesn't happen here, but <laughs> shopping is an absolute addiction. Is that yeah, 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 yeah. Shopping addiction. Shopping and addiction. Workaholism is yeah. an addiction, but it's socially sanctioned. Yeah. You know, if somebody works skating eight hours a week, we say, what a. Yeah, what a worker, worker, yeah. But if they drank like that or right. drug like that, right. we would say that was deviant. So there's a stigma, but yeah. workaholism is, is valued. Yeah, and I think also, pop, you know, eating disorders possibly. Um, could be classified as an addict because you're addicted to the idea of losing weight or, you know, maintaining a perfect body, um, and that's a very addictive thing too. The other question that I had is, you said that Vermont is the, the pilot. Um, are any other states doing Writers for Recovery that you know of? I think there are probably some. You know, I found some writing programs online, um, just searching for them, but nobody's doing it. Kind of, there, there's, to my knowledge. There's not a dedicated organization. I mean, we are, a, you know, we're a nonprofit. We're funded mostly through Department of Corrections and through the Rona, Rona Jaffe Fund, which is a New York City literary foundation. And through, um, and we get private donations from, you know, every, everyday people. I'd encourage you, if you want to donate to us, we promise to use the money wisely to do some good in this area. Um, so as far as I know, we're the only one, but we are looking to expand um, you know, at least in, into the rest of New England. And that's a, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Like we need to raise more money, but we really want to do it. Yeah. Um, as I admitted earlier, I, I um, have been addicted to, to cigarettes and to other things, but my PTSD from childhood, actually I tried marijuana once and I was put on Thorazine and was considered mentally ill. And you haven't spoken at all about the coexistence of addiction and mental illness and OCD and how it's all kind of interrelated. And I know most people end up in prison, but not everyone, some of us end up in a mental hospital and that becomes a stigma. 
Sure. I'm it's a, that's. Why you can't get a job. It's an even worse stigma. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, a number of people um, who have been in and are in Writers for Recovery have co-occurring co mental health issues, and that's a big that's a big driver um, and a kind of um, yeah co-occurring condition with addiction, certainly. So yeah, yeah. Could you describe a meeting of writing recovery? What happened? Yeah. Oh, great. I'll do that. Um, so basically, it's really it's really simple. Um, we get together uh, once a week for an hour and a half, and we usually do a ten week session. So we do ten weeks of one and a half hours each week. Um, anyone who's in recovery or has a family member in recovery or is has you know other issues of recovery affecting their life is welcome to come and join. Um, I we use um, short writing prompts. And let me give you an example. Um, I will say to them, to a workshop, here's your prompt. Finally, I understood the truth. And you have seven, you have seven minutes to write it, go. The only rule is there's no way to do it wrong. We don't care if it's a poem or a song or fiction or nonfiction. We don't care if it's spelled right. We don't care if the grammar's right. We don't care if the punctuation's right. We don't care about any of that. Write for seven minutes. No way to do it wrong. Pe then people write for seven minutes. At the end of that, I'll say, who would like to share? But you don't have to share. You can keep to yourself whatever you, whatever you wrote, because sometimes people write deeply personal things they don't want to share. People most often share. Sometimes they don't, and that's OK. Um, sometimes they don't even write, and that's OK. We, we, we told people, you don't even have to write. Just show up and spend some time. Welcome to come and hang out um, and listen to other people. Uh, when someone reads their work, uh, then we talk about it, and there's only one rule, uh, two rules for that. First rule I've already mentioned, nothing leaves this room, okay, unless the writer gives permission. So, or the, or the people give permission. So they go, what? Who you see here, what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here. That's right. That's right. I mean, we're not, we're not a 12, we're not a strictly 12 step, but we do abide by that. Um, and, and of course, uh, I should say, um, we have a great blog where we publish, people publish a lot of the things they write in Writers for Recovery, and we also publish um, an, an, an anthology. I'm gonna leave a couple copies of this. You get a copy for being the closest guesser on the, um, on the number. Um, anyway, so the, that's the first rule is, you know, everything stays in confidence unless a person says, hey, will you publish my poem on the blog? That's okay, and people can publish incidentally anonymously if they want, or they can use their own name, or they can use a pseudonym. So we try to make it easy. Um, and then the other rule is um, all comments need to be positive and supportive. So this isn't a traditional writer's workshop where you read someone's work and you go, your descriptions are terrible, your dialogue sucks, and you have no future as a writer, so you might as well quit now. We're not about that. You know, we're not about that. Because we're not really a workshop designed to teach people how to write. We're a workshop designed to support people in their recoveries by telling their stories on paper and out loud. That's a significant difference. Although I will say that when I compliment, you know, you or you on something that you've written, I say, oh, you wrote a great description. Hey, everybody can learn from that. Try it. She wrote a great description. Try it. She wrote great dialogue. Try it. He wrote a hilarious story. How did he make it funny? Give it a try. Write a funny story yourself. So people become um, better writers as a side effect. But it's not really about that. So we do that for 10 weeks. And then we, if the people in the group, enough people in the group are willing, for an 11th week we do a public reading of our work. So people sign up. They each read for about three, or three to five minutes and invite family, friends, community members. It's open. We give a reading. I usually bake a couple cakes. And then we have cake. 
and everyone goes off and goes home. And then once a year, we publish this anthology. Um, we also, we had a podcast with VT e. Digger um, last fall, and we're actually, we will be having a podcast on Vermont Public Radio starting, I believe, in January. I'm actually going to record an episode, an inter some interviews for that tomorrow up in Newport, um, and it's gonna be really great. So keep your ears open for Registry Recovery on VPR. Um, Anybody else? Yeah. How many people do you have leading uh, writers for recovery workshops in the Uh, it depends. It's honestly, it's mostly me. We do about uh, fifteen to seventeen workshops a year. So I'm I'm really busy a lot. I mean, literally, I'm doing like four a week sometimes. Um, Bess O'Brien does a couple, and then we have um, we've had a, like three other, four other teachers do workshops when I wasn't able to schedule them in. So. You know, like half a dozen, probably. Yeah. Yes? Well, my daughter works in this, in this field. She started with pain management, but she's now working with uh, a lot of people who have addictions. And she started, took her mom, uh, started doing a, uh, Willow was working with a uh, journaling uh, to self. It was a journal to yourself. And she's been working with a couple of her patients, as many as, as she could involve in that. Quite productive to her. She's up in yeah, I'm. I'm sure. I'm sure it has been. And one of our goal. One of our kind of dream goals is to get someone from a university, um, you know, addiction treatment department or psychology department to come and do a study on us to see because I have incredible amounts of anecdotal evidence. Uh, mostly people saying, you know, this is better than therapy. This really worked for me. This helped me a lot. Uh, but we would love to get some real data on how effective it is. I mean, there's data already that shows that if you write in a journal every day, you're mental, you tend to be mentally healthier than if you don't. But there's a lot of room for more study. Yeah? Where, where do you have these groups? I, I, I missed the beginning of the... Oh, yeah, sure. Um, we have them all over the state. Right now, there are no groups active at this point. Um, but we'll be rolling out some more in this in probably in January. And if you go to writersforrecovery.org, you can find a list of workshops. Um, unsure of where we're planning them for January. Uh, and do you know about the Antioch recovery, the, the workshops that they do? Because that's Maggie Thompson, who is our writer teacher in, here at the center. She has the very same rules. Yeah. No, no, no negative criticism, you know, all that. And we do it right here, and it's done through the Antioch. Um, oh, really? Oh, I should talk to her. Yeah. I've seen her name. I, I, um, she's very good, and I've taken her. And so it's a recovery based workshop? No, it's, it's just a writing a workshop. Memoir, memoir mostly, but there's also yeah. other stuff. The memoir includes that. Yeah. You know, I used to think the only way to teach people to write was to kind of yell at them and tell them what they did wrong. But I'm, I'm flipping the coin on that one. Um, yeah? So these workshops are free? The workshops are free, yeah. And is it often the case, or sometimes the case, that people are coming to your workshop, but they're also getting maybe the methadone treatment or some other kind of treatment? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, a, a, almost everyone who's in a Writers for Recovery workshop is doing some other kind of thing to aid in their addiction. The vast majority do do 12-step. Um, a, lot, a lot of people therapy, some medication-assisted treatment, um, some you know, meditation or you know, mindfulness, all sorts of different approaches. Yeah, we're not a, um, we're not a, and we never would pretend to be a place where you, know, you come and write with us and your addiction is done, yeah. No, we don't. That's only happened once um, in the entire time that we've, we've done it. People have generally you know, been really good about that, but we did have a, a gentleman in Burlington who showed up and was obviously heavily under the influence. And, you know, he just, and some, someone just said, you know, 
you look, you look like you could use a little rest. Why don't you just go home and maybe come back next week? And he said, okay. You know, we, we do, would try to be gentle about it. I mean, but yeah. Yeah. This is more of a comment, I think, but um, I was really struck by your idea that the opposite of addiction is community. And I'm in thinking about what's going on all over. It seems like the opposite of fascism could be community as well. The opposite of hatred and racism. I mean, that, so when you say practice something other than addiction, practice community, Mary Ellis had some examples, the church, the yeah. senior center. But what are some other things? Just walking down the street, how do you practice community? Isn't that worth thinking about? For yeah. all of us, just yeah. make eye contact. Make yeah. eye contact, there you go. And smile. Say hi. I'm a hi sayer. Hi, hi. Um, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of ways. Um, and, you know, we're so, um, it was amazing. I went to, so I lived in Boston for 16 years. I used to take the T, the train, to work every day. People would read books. People would have conversations, you know, whatever on the train. Friends would be sitting, talking to each other. And I haven't, I haven't been down there much. And I went back recently and rode the train. Everybody. Everybody, everybody, just like that, you know, and I even when I mean, I recognized it even when we first had that, you know, the cassette tape Walkmans and everyone would have their own music. I thought that kind of sucked because, you know, music's something you share with people. It's not something you isolate over, you know, and, I, and, and so our society has just become so atomized by technology, you know, there's no, you, you can, and, and we live in a time when you can, you know, in theory, be in contact from, to the whole world from your living room, so why do you need to leave? And, and then when you're out in public, you're too busy, you know, looking at your phone. And I'm as, believe me, you'll see me walking through Montpelier. Uh, um, I'm as guilty as the next guy, maybe guiltier. Um, but yeah, so it's, it, you know, it's tough to get community. This is just a silly comment, but it's apropos. A friend of mine moved here fairly recently from Havana. Yeah. And I said, how do you like it here? He said, I love it in Montpelier. The people smile at you, they say hello. He said, not like the people on the subway in Beijing. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> that was even with before the cell phone. Yeah. But there is something open about the community that Mary Alice is talking about. And yeah. the eye contact that it matters. Yeah, and I've thought about that too. You know, when I lived in a, in a bigger city, you know, you're surrounded by people all the time, and it's really hard to get a little private time to yourself. So I, I understand why people just want to go, boop, shut the world off, not say hi to their neighbor. I totally get it, you know, but it, but it, and, and I, because I tend to be not, sometimes not very social, um, but there's, you know, there's, that's detrimental in ways, and, and, uh, yeah. Disregarded people, or not heard them, or talked over them, and that is another way of. Like, I'm telling. That's a great point. Thank you. I should, probably should have talked about that, but you know, when someone comes into a writer's recovery group and they've got all this baggage and they're really struggling in their recovery, and then at the end of ten weeks they can stand up in front of a crowd and read their work, it's unbelievable what it does for them. It's just unreal to stand up and say, this is my story, I'm owning this story, I'm not ashamed of it. This is who I am, and I'm trying to be a better person. I'm trying to get my, my act together. I'm trying to move up in my recovery. We had a guy who had such crippling anxiety that he couldn't walk down Church Street in Burlington, you know? He couldn't. He was a recovering heroin addict, early in recovery. He'd have to go around, you know, to get to our meeting, which was off Church Street because he just couldn't stand it. His anxiety was so bad being around people. After like 10 weeks, he stood up in front of 60 people and read, you know, three of his poems. It's like, wow. You know, and how did he feel after that? He felt fantastic, you know? And I should point out too that like, we're not saying writer's recovery is for everybody. It's just like any other thing. It works for who it works for. Some people come and they try it out and they don't really like it and they go and that's totally fine. 
I don't, I don't have, I'm not insulted by that. I'm not, you know, I'm not ready to defend writing as a great, you know, even though I'm a writer, I'm not, it's not, it's not a be all, end all, be all, whatever. It's just another, another way to get at the problem. Anything else? See, all right, the, what? The amount of addiction decreasing in Vermont? What? Are we making progress? Is the amount of addiction decreasing? I think we're making, progress a little bit with opiates, um, but I've heard late, and you know, you should, it's hard because we don't have the, we only have the data from, you know, two years ago, whatever. Um, I think we're making a little progress against opiates, but then I've heard about a resurgence of meth. And I don't know, and that's one of the problems is, you know, fighting the addiction will get you so far, but fighting the roots of the addiction is really the way to get at it and stop it. And I'm, I'm honestly, I'm really, really worried because we have a generation of little kids right now who've had their parents taken, been taken away from their parents, have had their lives disrupted by heroin addiction, who've been you know, put in foster homes of varying quality, who've been disconnected from their families, whose fathers and mothers are in prison, and you know, you couldn't create a better recipe for building another generation of addicts. And like, what are we gonna do to make sure that doesn't happen? Do we have the will as a society to do it? Do we have the resources to do it? I don't know, but I'm worried about it. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, when I go to a family gathering and all the kids, and you say something, you see the kids go on their cell phone, and you can get very paranoid thinking they're talking about you. Yeah, yeah, that must be hard. Um, did you see the article day before yesterday? I want to say that in Silicon Valley, where all the tech people live, they're now like they're hiring all their nannies, and they're saying. My children are absolutely not allowed to use any technology. What does it tell you that the guys who invented the stuff are keeping it away from their children? We should heed that message. I mean, it was, I, I'm horrified by the fact that, you know, school, high school, whatever, kids are allowed to have their cell phones. To me, that's nonsense. They don't need them. They need to call someone, they can go to the office and call somebody. You know, and it's an incredible distractor to learning. And to, and to learning socialization, which is a huge part of, you know, becoming a responsible adult. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it.